Well, the hush indicates we seem to have begun. Uh, welcome. I I think I know most everyone, if, if I haven't met you. Uh, my name is Charles Waldheim, and um, it's my pleasure to welcome you here uh, this afternoon and to introduce our speakers on the occasion of the launch of uh, Third Coast Atlas. Um, uh, in addition to saying uh, a couple of things um, about the book and saying something about, um, about our speakers, um, I also want to begin um, by acknowledging uh, the school, uh, the events office, um, everyone involved in the organization preparation of today's events. Thank you all so much for all of your uh, support and contributions. The Third Coast Atlas uh, is the result of contributions and collaborations from a range of contributors, uh, some three or four dozen of them, uh, migrant intellectuals, architects, academics on both sides of the US-Canadian border. Uh, and it's really uh, in their uh, in their honor that we're able to present it to you here uh, today. Uh, for me, it's a great pleasure to be able to launch the book, but also to um, welcome back to the school some dear uh, old friends of mine. Uh, first of all, Mason White. Um, Mason is an American-Canadian architect and urbanist based in Toronto. Uh, he's associate professor at the University of Toronto and principal in Latter office, uh, most recently co-author with his partner Lola Shepard of Many Norths, Spatial Practice in a Global Territory. Um, welcome, Mason. Also joining us, Claire Lister from Chicago. Claire is an Irish architect and urbanist, associate professor at the University of Illinois uh, at Chicago. She's principal of uh, CLUA, Claire Lister Urbanism and Architecture, based in Chicago. And she is author of, among other things, Learning from Logistics, How Networks Inform Cities. Uh, both Mason and Claire are uh, co-editors of the book, as is uh, Daniel Ibanez. Danny Ibanez is a Spanish architect and urbanist, doctoral candidate here at the GSD. Uh, he is co-editor with Nico Katsikas of New Geography's Six Grounding Metabolism, among many other things, and principle of Margin Lab. Uh, we also want to acknowledge and thank the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts and Sarah Herta and the board of the Graham in particular. Uh, it was their support um, and the support of Akhtar uh, and Ramon Pratt, among other things, that enabled us to produce the book uh, that you see in front of you. Uh, in addition to the contributors, uh, it's also the resultant of a design concept from Sienna Scarf Design. So Sienna, thanks for being here and for all your work uh, on the Atlas. And the book is also the result of a collaboration between a range of institutions, um, the University of Illinois Chicago Office of the Vice Chancellor Chancellor for Research, the University of Toronto Connaught Fund, and our own Harvard uh, GSD, uh, Dean Faculty Research Funds, among other things. Um, the, the book is also, in many ways, um, implicated in the origin of the MDES stream urbanism landscape ecology. Uh, as Danny Ibanez joined in that first uh, year in 2010, 2011, he and a group of MDESers really formed a cohort of researchers that began to mobilize the book, uh, several of whom have now gone on to their own doctoral work. That includes contributions from a range of people, including Travis Bost, Dong Se Kim, Case Lokman, uh, Ivan Alvarez, and Omar Davis, among many, many others. And so in that sense, the book is really, as much as anything else, a product of the research agenda of the school. It was also the subject, uh, the Third Coast Atlas, of research seminars uh, both here and at the University of Toronto. And so it's the work of uh, graduate students on both sides of the border that really uh, informed uh, the work. The Atlas began with a really simple uh, claim uh, and emerged in a conversation that uh, Claire Lister and I had now over a decade ago, let's say, sometime in the past, in which we thought it would be timely and maybe interesting to try to claim uh, this region, this territory, as a new urban gestalt, as, it, as its own uh, urban condition. Uh, from that conversation, we mobilized work around the project, um, and we felt strongly, the two of us, that it would be important for us to have um, a noted international figure on the Canadian side. We invited Mason White to join us from Toronto. And as we did the work, we found that Danny Ibanez was doing all the actual work, whereas we, took, we were taking a lot of conversations. And so it ultimately, it was only appropriate that Danny was also credited as a co-editor. Um, the book you'll see is, um, among other things, aspiring to be an atlas. There was something, uh, on the one hand, um, quite anachronistic about that, that appealed to us. The idea of, in the digital era, doing something which is a printed book as an atlas at that 
trim size and with that heft, and also something dry, like something that would be a reference work. And we're interested in the contradiction, um, the kind of um, the contradiction in, in the digital era that almost by definition every fact in the book when it went to print is now obsolete. There's something about the persistence of the atlas as a format in which obviously we have better formats and more contemporary knowledge. And at the same moment, the idea of the map as a sort of subtext. Um, you'll see that the book is structured and both uh, Mason and, and, and Claire and Danny will say something more about this in particular. But just by way of introduction, um, we're motivated by, um, by the idea of a kind of thick description. So we're trying to describe the region through a variety of media, a variety of lenses. These include uh, photographs, maps, diagrams, charts. They include a range of speculative or theoretical uh, essays. They include a, a range of uh, various forms of data that, that my colleagues will say more about. We're, of course, also um, motivated by the idea that, of course, henceforth, um, the map precedes the territory. Uh, regions are not given naturally occurring, even though many of us work in fields that have a tendency toward a kind of uh, geological determinism. Uh, we're committed to the idea that the claiming of a territory, the claiming of a region is itself its own cultural act, and that that somehow needs to begin initially in language and then ultimately through graphic and, and, and cartographic representation. And so in that sense, the atlas is a very old format. It's an old structure of thought. It's a traditional means, but at the same moment, moment, we've been motivated by the idea that we could claim a new territory, somehow a, a kind of autonomous region that's not a region that figures in our collective uh, imaginary. Uh, we were very fortunate to have uh, Keller Easterling from Yale University author a brief forward to the piece. Uh, Keller's piece was, I think, quite instrumental in the sense that she argues that most often, as architects and urbanists, as we engage in describing the conditions we find for urbanization around the world, most often we are somehow implicitly or explicitly obliged to adopt the language of finance, of capital, of management, uh, a kind of global management tease is the formulation that Keller uses. And in place of that, she makes a very forthright, a very clear argument for the opposite, which is we need in our own disciplinary habits of mind, our own disciplinary formation, to formulate our own languages, our own terms of art, our own own technical and professional uh, formulations of knowledge. And in that regard, she argues the Third Coast Atlas is one part of that project to not only describe or claim a region that in other ways might not otherwise have been thought of as a region, but in so doing, uh, to recuperate or revise our understanding of what a region is, but equally to claim the terms of research for our own fields uh, and not simply feel obliged to pass those through the terms of, uh, of uh, global uh, managers, uh, capitalists, and the like. <clears throat> There's also um, something in the rhetoric of the book visually, you can see this in the design strategy, you can see it in the maps and this digital elevation model, in which there's something of a territory which, while it rarely figures in our collective imaginary, you know, when, when I grew up, um, the weather map stopped at Buffalo. There's something about the idea of a borderland, right? So eight, eight, eight states and two provinces, uh, the collection of this incredible resource of fresh water, but in which, um, we don't really have a collective sense of what that territory looks like in that iconic cultural imaginary form that so many other parts of the world are legible in. And so on some basic level, that's uh, one of the key aspirations um, of the thesis. And you'll see, and my colleagues will say more about a range of uh, introductory and kind of um, diagrammatic pieces. We're interested in Clifford Geertz's notion of thick description, the idea that we need multiple layers of empirical and other formations of knowledge in which we can describe a condition. And so you'll see a range of photographs. Uh, you can see here a portfolio of photographs. These are NASA satellite images which describe the region in certain contexts and certain atmospheres from a certain point of view. And then we juxtapose that with um, terrestrial photography. In, in this case, a portfolio of photographs by the Toronto-based photographer Robert Burley, in which case the you know, the horizon position is really a trope of landscape photography, landscape painting, but in which um, there's something about the foreshore, something about the atmospheric condition that invokes the quality of being on the Great Lakes, that for those of us that have lived and worked in this territory, we've spent some time there. There's something about the relationship between those images that, that thickens and, and builds an account that we somehow find uh, legible. Uh, in, in the couple of moments that I've got left with my introductory remarks before I hand it over to, to Mason to say more, 
I wanted to take one case from the book, because in addition to photographs and satellites, uh, we have a range of cartographic portfolios. So we thought it would be important to implicate our own atlas and the idea that other maps have been made historically. And for my part, uh, maybe the most compelling case uh, for my part in the book is the case of the United States uh, Lake Survey. In 1841, the US Congress authorized the US Army's Bureau of Topographical Engineers, later Corps of Engineers, to undertake a lake survey of the northern and northwestern lakes. Uh, this survey was headquartered in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, it was charged with prosecuting a comprehensive topographical survey and with publishing maps and charts of the region. This was the, the kind of cartographic uh, military uh, campaign equivalent to enable the settlement of the Northwest Territory, such, such, such as they were known. Um, the publication of these maps and charts was intended to facilitate the opening of these territories to trade and settlement, and also to hasten their transition to statehood. Uh, they were equally concerned, of course, with the national project of self-description and the maintenance of clear and defensible borders given the relative historical hostil hostility around the border to the north. Um, these maps and charts of the survey, they reveal the increasing cartographic sophistication beginning in the 1840s through the 1870s and 80s. And they equally also ultimately produce a, 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 a form in which the region begins to cohere. Um, and here I'm, I'm interested in this final drawing, this is 1879, a kind of comprehensive survey. And as, as a close reading, what I'm really interested in here is the idea that you can see on this surface, on the one hand, the kind of minimal, almost spare quality, only making a few marks, a few key <coughs> indications of intent, but in so doing, really beginning to construct a kind of cartographically um, legible and enduring indication of this region as one place. Uh, lines of latitude curve across the drawing, lines of latitude converge toward the north. Uh, against those generalized reference lines of latitude and longitude, there is this complex network of survey points. You can see here with the heraldry at the, at the top, very kind of modest compared to some of the other historical maps of, the, of, of, of empire that we'll see. And you can see here in some of these detailed um, pieces of the map, they're only really interested in describing the relationship of latitude and longitude. They're interested in the relationship between the edge of the lake and safe navigable harbors and navigable interior waterways. And then finally, this very perverse, this very um, strange kind of mesh-like tri triangulation, which was the technical innovation of the lake survey. So the lake survey led by then Captain Molitor, who eventually gets promoted to Colonel in the Corps of Engineers, produces this triangulation at the end of the process rather than at the beginning of the process. And so you can see in this one cartographic uh, document, this one uh, piece of evidence that's in the atlas, the idea of not only claiming the territory and trying to construct a rationale of national identity and boundary and manifest destiny, among other things, but equally a series of new cartographic and topographic conventions. Uh, the significance in the cartographic arts, uh, we could include the idea of charting and surveying the lakes, beginning with individual harbor mouths and then scaling up to construct maps of individual states, and then eventually to construct this regional cartographical device. Ultimately, um, Molitor and his team produced a whole range of cartographic innovations, including a whole series of both engraving, copper plating, and stone tablet techniques. And by the end of this work, at the end of the 19th century, they were producing more than 20,000 charts a year by these methods. So we have to understand this is a kind of broadly distributed uh, conception of the Great Lakes, really for the first time historically, to be consumed by those that were engaged in the activity of settlement of the region. And so in those documents and in a range of other documents that we gather together and curate in the atlas, we see really the process not only of, kind of nation state building, but equally of uh, the construction of the territory that will ultimately become to be known um, as the Great Lakes. With that, I will hand to uh, Mason White and Claire Lister, who will tell you more about the contents of the atlas. Thank you, Charles. Um, so the, the pieces I'm going to show from the book are uh, the portfolio section, which is about mapping and cartographic acts, uh, looking at the broader region um, throughout this duration, about 200 years. Um, I'm also going to show, I guess, where the atlas would get its name, some of the um, mapping and charts that were done for the publication, and then close with um, some of the profile studies of individual cities, so you can get a kind of broader sense on the drawings that are included in the atlas. Uh, so uh, this is a small series, actually, near the front of the book that 
is, is looking literally at the act of mapping. Um, so for example, uh, the, what we were trying to document over this 200 year period, a very busy active uh, period, in, both in the world in terms of exploration, is to show uh, the, the cartography as a form of power, cartography as a form of exploration, and cartography as a form of projection as well. Um, so you have here Boisseau's map on the right, apologies that it's rotated, um, from 1643. And this is really the first map uh, to delineate and identify all five of the lakes, despite them actually having different uh, names. Um, but but a very important uh, map historically. Um, following that one, only by about 40 years difference, um, and you can see the kind of figuration of the, the water bodies is sort of uh, evolving um, into their maybe more true accurate form. Um, you have uh, a map actually drawn by Coronelli, but but um, really inspired by uh, Champlain. And um, what you can see here is how articulate the coastlines have become. Suddenly the coastline is a kind of uh, amenity. Um, and you can see the, the kind of accuracy fades once you get just west of the Mississippi. Um, you can see there's a kind of confusion of scale where the Rocky Mountains looks like they're immediately proximate to the Mississippi. But that's a sort of illusion of distance. Um, but the, the rivers and the kind of naming systems uh, transposed onto this map is important, again, as part of this kind of uh, cartography as exploration. Um, so those are the French explorers, uh, French mapping technique. These last two I'm going to show are, are really uh, the Brits. This is the uh, kind of English um, uh, era of, of mapping. This is 1812, uh, of course, centered around the War of 1812, showing Upper and Lower Canada, with the designation of Upper as actually being upstream and Lower as being downstream. Um, and here you can see townships are marked along that northern edge. So suddenly the relationship between demarcating uh, sites of um, future urbanism or sites of occupation in comparison to the kind of coastal amenities uh, being central as a kind of uh, war act, as a kind of strategizing um, act. And this last one within that suite um, is, is actually by John Smith, uh, who was a lieutenant governor of uh, New France uh, at the time, uh, Nouvelle France. And what you can see here is the pro uh, projection of a railroad system running from northern Lake Ontario um, across towards, I guess, present-day Windsor uh, and Detroit. And, and um, this, this sort of, I think this, uh, within the book, it, it also, you, you can see the connection between land and water waterways. So you see the waterway uh, as a kind of mode of mobility, um, as well as the imagination of this future railway creating new potentials for commerce, new potentials for movement of people and goods. Um, so after that interlude, you come to, um, I don't know where this would be within the kind of sandwich stratification, but somewhere after the bread, uh, you would get a bit more in the middle, the set called projections, um, which is actually between the potentials and prospects uh, series, which Claire is going to speak about. Um, and th these are literally a set of drawings um, produced by the team um, to show and demonstrate the importance of the um, Great Lakes Basin uh, and, and the cities that encompass it. So here, I mean, I, I think the drawing really speaks for itself in showing the magnitude um, really only in the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes have any kind of legibility at that scale. Everything else is, is a vein. The, they're the only major arteries. and. And then this kind of lays out the cases also on the back of the book. This kind of lays out the argument and case uh, visually, graphically, of the third coast there in the middle of the Great Lakes coastline unfurled. Um, and you can see of the three coasts uh, within the US and Canada, uh, Pacific and Atlantic, um, the only one that is truly continuously urban. Um, and it also uh, uh, defeats the others in terms of, of length. <laughs> um, well, if this were a, a thumb, thumb wrestling match, I suppose it would win. Um, this is a, a pretty powerful diptych to us uh, as editors, and, and we were working with our collaborators, because it really builds the, uh, the kind of parallel arguments of the water as a continuous body um, hydrologically, um, seen in terms of ecology, seen in terms of commerce. And then on the right side, the kind of constellation of cities 
that have agglomerated along that edge to capitalize on the water body as a kind of viscous opportunity. Um, and so this is a really important diptych. Uh, maybe equally building on that with greater detail, you have um, on the left the basin, uh, the, the five water basins tied to each water body, as well as their, you can see in gray, their uh, urbanized uh, areas. And then on the right, the waterborne commerce. And you can see the line subtly thin out as it distributes to um, destinations. Um, and then here, for comparison's sake, each basin seen in isolation with their um, relative uh, cities uh, agg agglomerating next to them. And you can see the kind of morphology of those unfurled. Um, and probably an image you have seen or a drawing you have seen before, this, this is sort of central to include, maybe only on the right, uh, the 3D visualization maybe is something you have not seen before. But this really illustrates how that continuity between uh, water bodies is managed. So you've got locks, you have canals that are negotiating that, um, and the profiles of each of these water bodies is so distinct and unique. You've got Lake Erie, second from the bottom on the right, which is really shallow and is uh, in a constant state of being dredged versus Lake Superior, which is actually kind of threatening water body. There's the number of shipwrecks in there are innumerable. Um, and Lake Michigan is the only north-south water body. Um, so the, the kind of distinct traits of each one um, is, is sort of presented in, in kind of factual measured form. Um, here is where you start to get a, maybe a kind of convention of atlas making where you see, um, I always like uh, this form of representation of the water bodies because the, the water bodies start to look like islands. You get this weird inversion where the land reads as oceanic and the water reads as a landmass, and then you have these cities that are sort of um, nibbling at the coastline edge, um, trying to eke as much from that as possible. And they document both population in terms of the metro area and the larger uh, municipal um, uh, area of each city, as well as the length of coastline dedicated uh, to that city, the uh, city center. Uh, and here, a comparison of 12 that we selected, um, looking at kind of spatial demographics of those. And again, for some, you can really detect a uh, coastline, uh, Toronto, um, Chicago, of course, are very obvious. Others, a little bit less so, Cleveland, um, Rochester. You know, it's kind of nebulous to know where the coastline is or what, what's the kind of desirable um, proximity to um, the convenience of having water. And in, so that, that closes out that section. Um, in this next section is profiles. And this is where we surveyed and documented about 30 um, cities and, and, and smaller municipalities uh, along the Great Lakes. This drawing on the right shows the land use designation around the entire perimeter of each of the five lakes. Um, using the conventions of planning, so the, the color code, apologies for the candy, candy colors there, but it, it lends a kind of immediacy to um, detecting industrial land uses, commercial land uses, agricultural, um, and, and this is really a kind of a convention um, in planning, and, and so it was a, a useful prop to make this, um, the, the distinct traits of each uh, water body legible, and even to the point where pulling them each apart so they, they really read as distinct. Um, so here I'll show two different um, diptychs of, um, uh, of, of um, profiles. So on the left, here you have Chicago and uh, Illinois, and on the right, Gary, Indiana. Um, really what's notable here in terms of the, the method of representation is that you have a, a coalescing of major infrastructure as well as land uses immediately proximate to the water. So it might be, an, um, it might be a, a river's mouth. It might be a, a major coastline along the lake. Um, and you have them combined along with any important designations that are within those um, catchment areas. And then you have only the land use, only the aerial photography, and then only the kind of cutout, the aerial um, cutout of that, uh, that um, uh, edge. Um, so here, uh, what, you can, what you can see is the distinct kind of industrial nature of Gary, Indiana, whereas the more eclectic water coastal usage uh, within Chicago. And on the second pairing, um, as an interesting set, is uh, Toronto's uh, kind of lake 
river-based organization of land uses versus Rochester's river-based um, organization of industry and commerce. Um, these are, again, four out of 30. Um, I'll, I'll leave to you to pour through those a little bit more. And then here's just a zoom in uh, to get a better sense on the, some of the um, details that unfortunately are not coming out in the spread, but just to see how you, you we, we only articulated um, development that was caught within this sort of boundary immediately adjacent to water to get a sense on, um, uh, in this case, the Genesee River uh, in, in Rochester. Um, so with that, I will leave it um, to Claire. Okay, so next P book, um, as I said before, all our mini books begin with P. Um, this is the potentials category, um, which includes a few people on our panel. So if I do get it wrong, <laughs> don't be afraid to correct me. Um, <clears throat> This section, um, I suppose you would describe, um, makes a shift in the book because the book maybe starts to become a little more projective from here on out, whereas perhaps the previous graphics were more indexical. <clears throat> and we, um, through both open call and direct solicitation, um, we invited a series of uh, academic practitioners in the region who were already completing work on some condition or some resource or some system or some landscape um, in the region. Um, and this is just, um, <clears throat> I'm just going to go through real quickly um, the kind of range of those contributions. Um, I've kind of recurated these just for the sake of this conversation into kind of four categories. This is not the order that they appear in the book. Um, the first category is just kind of large scale concepts for the region. Um, and Pierre's text kicks off um, that category um, where he's starting to look at the term regionalization or trying to understand different definitions of the term region as it pertains to the Great Lakes. And he starts out with kind of discussing familiar terms that we might all be predisposed to, rust belt, manufacturing belt, <clears throat> but then more interestingly starts to uncover maybe alternative um, terms that emerge from a, a significant events um, over the kind of 150, 200 years. So for example, he talks about the Great Cutover, which was when a massive extent of land was cleared for lumber, not only for the urbanization of the Great Lakes, but also on the coast, because all the lumber would be shipped um, to the main cities and then shipped out to the different coasts. Um, and as a result of that, I think like something like 10 million acres in northern Michigan alone were cleared. Um, but at, at, as a result of that um, and the kind of decimation of the landscape um, emerged a way of thinking about the region through um, the subsequent management of land or through land economics, which was a completely new way to start to kind of categorize or think about a region at that time. Then he kind of continues on. It's somewhat chronological and starts to look at how um, the different, the expansion of the region through the artificial hydrological networks, reversal of the Chicago River, or the kind of um, the numerous canals that started to link the region or expand the region beyond its governmental um, extents to kind of continental, or at least half the continental scale, because um, in many of these cases, the networks would um, link the Great Lakes to larger territorial um, um, regions. And then subsequently going on talking about um, deurbanization of the area in the kind of post-war where the, the kind of hegemony or the hierarchy or the centricity of the cities started to kind of be eroded in favor of a much more kind of flatter or horizontal landscape and the implications for that for the region. And also how the region really, um, much of the kind of ecological crisis as it pertains to planning in regions really emerged in the Great Lakes because it was the first era that kind of suffered a deindustrialization, but also the first region that started to sort of make legible the consequences of industrialization and charts many significant events such as the Love Canal um, that then um, sort of implied federal agencies such as the EPA, the Clean Water Act, 
all emerging in the kind of early 1970s as a result of um, what was happening. Um, and then kind of ends, as most of the essays end, with some sort of way to think about how the regional paradigm might evolve um, in, in the future. And that's kind of the structure of most texts is um, that the, the research is somewhat projective and so tries to go beyond just the kind of information itself to offer some sort of contemplation for moving forward. Um, Kathy Velikoff and Jeff Thune um, look, um, really this is a summary of their work, their interest is actually slightly beyond the scale of the Great Lakes to the Great Lakes mega region which is one of the 10 mega regions designated by the RPA, um, and start to look at mapping that region, but in a kind of more alternative sense, which they call these shed cartographies, working in the vein of Corner, even McHarg, where they're starting to um, collect and combine disparate layers of information and overlapping them on these maps and finding conflicts or anomalies or consistencies as a way to reread the region, um, whether it's through medical economies or power sheds or energy systems. Um, I think we have six maps, which is a kind of small um, subsection of their larger suite um, of work that they've been doing over the last few years. Um, and then the last one, this kind of large scale, is Phil Inquist. Phil is managing partner of SOM in Chicago, but has been looking at the Great Lakes for longer than any of us in this room. Um, and this is a kind of summary of his research kind of independently of SOM, but also, you know, with, with SOM. So it has a particular kind of, you know, angle um, that starts to kind of say that if planning usually encompasses a 25 to 35 year um, sort of uh, future, that we need to go beyond that to this kind of mega scale, which he calls a 100 year vision. Um, and he also cites that we need to kind of move beyond our kind of disciplines or our political jurisdictions uh, to what he calls this holistic thinking um, that also involves the public as a kind of, uh, the, the Great Lakes is a collective project as a planning um, um, proposition. Mm -hmm. um, moving into the kind of next section, which I'm calling edge um, or coastline, <coughs> quite literally. Um, looking at Michael Esban and Jana van der Goetz, um entry that talks about um, um, <clears throat> sediment management um, uh, in the Great Lakes. Um, the map there is sort of um, um, illustrating different um, um, disposal landscapes where much of the sediment is collected and sent upland or downstream um, and results in many different um, new landscapes in the area. Um, I think that there are 42 of these um, facilities in the Great Lakes. 20 are already full and, and, and capped and 22, the other 22 I think are at 80% um, um, fill um, and the millions and millions of, of um, cubic feet of sediment that's moved around every year. Um, and also they talk about the management of harbors, systems, um, and the locks, the, the over the 60 locks that are in the region, how they impact kind of the movement of sediment. The lower right image is a sonar map um, where they're using new technological systems to anticipate um, the kind of flow and the accumulation of sediment in different eras so that one as a kind of maintenance regime is prepared in advance um, because of course this has huge implications to commercial shipping in the region that channels must be maintained. Um, that's also an issue with boats um, becoming <coughs> larger and larger. Um, not too unlike that text, um, the next one by Sean Burkholder and Karen Lutsky also starts to look at the kind of buildup of sediment, but their text focuses more on the actual coastline itself and the fact that that's a very dynamic territory 
and that's related to not only sediment but also to the natural um, water level within the Great Lakes system, um, which it's still debatable the kind of cycle of high and low um, water level, but it can be as long as a 30 to 35 year cycle between low water level and high water level. They're also looking at um, new edges that are being created as a result of the reclamation of post-industrial land um, and other infrastructure. So that map actually is kind of useful for both essays in so far as it shows many of these um, CDFs and the kind of the large disks um, illustrate the extent or the volume of, of sediment being dredged and move around. Um, also within the kind of edge category is Mark Hogan and Tim Maley's text which is kind of more a political um, um, look at the border, um, focusing on smuggling and piracy over the sort of history of the Great Lakes. Um, so they talk about the, the smuggling of liquor during prohibition, um, and then more recently looking at more sort of daily smuggling as a result of the variance of tax um, um, regimes in the different states and in the different countries. Um, but they also kind of talk about how the lakes are actually like binational, but also a kind of soft boundary. Um, I think like something like 30,000 people cross the border daily at Buffalo, 20,000 people a day cross the border in the Detroit Windsor area. Um, so there's constant moving um, um, continually across the lakes, and that kind of, they, they sort of estimate how that plays out um, over the course of the text. Um, the next category is just kind of general landscape. Alyssa North is looking at corporate campuses in the region um, and looking at the sort of footprint of those campuses and how they could think perhaps more productively, I don't want to use the word sustainably, but um, about um, the landscape of those campuses. And she profiles three, the Herman Miller campus in Michigan, the Ford Rouge plant um, in Michigan, and a, um, What's the third one? It's in um, Ontario. It's the injection, the injection, injection. molding. Um, Rosetta um, Elkin, who's joining us. I forgot to tell us that Pierre, Rosetta, and um, Rania are here with us. Um, Rosetta is looking at the salt economy in the Great Lakes. You know, if we run out of water, we have tons of salt, <laughs> like tons of it. Um, and that resulted from, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rosetta, the sort of geological um, formation of the region resulted in a very robust salina formation um, that has sort of yielded these super mega salt mines. I think there's 16 mines of varying scales in the region. Um, Rosetta profiles one of the largest one of those, which is at Goderch, which is in Canada. Um, on the eastern side of Lake Huron. Um, I think the mine actually goes under Lake Michigan, or Lake Huron at that point. And also, um, look, so that's a kind of centralized uh, mining effort in that location, um, but also looks at a kind of more, what we call an urban mine under Detroit, and sort of plays those, the mining economy out as a result of, uh, I guess, the climate in the Great Lakes and that we need a lot of salt and that, yes, we have a great salt supply, but there's also enormous implications to the salt that we use on the ground um, on a kind of yearly basis. Um, Rania and El Hadi are looking as part of their larger project of looking at geographies of trash, are looking at um, Michigan and the Great Lakes in general, which is the kind of the, 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 the trash can of the Great Lakes. Toronto sends all its trash to Michigan. Um, but looking at then how, um, so within that kind of the politics of that, um, starts to look at um, different trash regimes, whether it would be centralized trash regimes, which we would have been more accustomed to, but which is now a problem, especially in the Detroit area with tons of capped landfills, um, versus perhaps maybe more local alternative ways 
um, of um, dealing with trash, but still respecting it as a necessary um, system to kind of think about as we move forward with the prospect of perhaps increased urbanization in the area. Um, the last section is the water section. Um, taken quite broadly, for example, Anya Demelski's and Jeff Manaw's text looks at, quote, solid state hydrology. Um, so not looking at water as an aqueous medium, um, but for example, starting to look at how the retreat of the ice sheets um, um, produced the, the kind of the geology and the topography of the region we know today. Um, and then a slightly chronological to moving on to the relationship of urbanization and the great, the, the era of the canal um, building, which I think there was eight canals built in a 30 year period, beginning with the Erie Canal in 1825. So a really, really um, intense era of um, hydrological infrastructure that they look at. And then uh, moving then more recently, um, they start to look at um, um, other water economies in the region. Again, snow removal in Montreal to um, uh, molecular uh, water as a molecular substance in the pharmaceutical industry um, in, in Wisconsin. Um, Jen McGray and Maria Arquero from Ann Arbor look at um, water drainage systems and um, in Detroit in particular and uh, how new forms of uh, water management uh, might um, deal with the kind of infrastructural disinvestment in general that's been happening in the area. They're also looking at um, combined sewer and stormwater um, um, pipelines that we have in many cities in the Great Lakes, which is problematic after kind of heavy rains or storm conditions because the sewer system is, is, is overrun. And so we have what we've called these outflows, which means the sewers are opened and the excess water is, is let out into whatever water body, predominantly the lakes. Um, and so how we might also prohibit that in the future through more alternative, softer forms of infrastructure that can deal with that water cycle. And then the last one in the water category is um, from Martin Felsen, who's the, one of the partners of Urban Lab, which is a Chicago um, design firm who for a while have been looking at uh, new forms of urbanism that might result from new water economies. Uh, in particular, they're interested in um, how water intensive economies would move from the southwest or areas where water is a big issue to the Great Lakes, but that there would be mandates um, whereby they would have to be more responsible about their water usage and how it's returned to the Great Lakes. Um, but even beyond that, they're interested too in the kind of new forms of urbanism. Um, so it's kind of like a formal project that would result um, with these new um, water um, industries that they call um, fresh planning, fresh water zones, which was a project they um, exhibited at the biennial last cycle or even the cycle before. I'm getting mixed up. Um, so that the, the, the potentials category as it's what I would call kind of like design research. Um, the next category, and I'm going to just quickly go through this, um, is called Prospects, which is um, a series of 12 essays about the 12 largest cities in the Great Lakes, 10 of which have a population of 1 million people or more. These were directly solicited by planner academic types where we said, just, just give us the, the, the kind of the lowdown on the state of your city as it is today. A kind of real frank Midwest roll your sleeves up, just give it to us as it is. Um, and uh, so they're kind of part historical. Um, they're part um, a little <coughs> potpourri of, of history of the city. Um, a, a lot of um, doom and gloom, as I say in these essays, because there's some you know commonalities between these cities. They've gone through rough eras. Um, but also, um, any reclamation projects that are currently undergoing are in the works. Um, so they're ending on, a, on an optimistic note. Um, the maps um, 
um, I'll just, and so all these 12 essays, I don't have all 12 of them here, um, no images, they were just to write 1,800, 2,000 words, um, but each um, um, entry is accompanied by this map that you see on the right, uh, which correlates multiple layers of information from population statistics to um, kind of significant urban events in a city's history to important urban um, milestones, important landmark buildings, cultural events, and so forth. And for the most part, um, what you'll notice is, you know, this is the city's inception, for the most part, early to mid-19th century, and you can see the steep rise in population to maybe up to the 20s, um, and then maybe 50s, 40s, 50s at peak, and then the kind of, this is Chicago, the kind of demise of the urban, po the city population. And then on the other hand, when metropolitan records become available, you can see how the metropolitan population spurs off um, in, in rising um, in compared to the, the city population. So Bob Brugman writes about Chicago. Uh, James Wasley writes about Milwaukee from the perspective of new water industries. Milwaukee opened a fresh water science lab. That's not the title of it, but kind of a, a research facility that has lots of pilot projects up and running, testing different ways to um, um, think about water quality. Um, and that's combined with the fact that Milwaukee has just recently released 200 acres of land almost downtown um, through the Inner Harbor project that will be a huge project in the region in the next 10, 15 years. Um, Detroit, Jerry Heron sort of summarizes a couple of essays he wrote for places over the last years looking at Detroit as the uncity, but sort of the, the, the liberation that perhaps Detroit might enjoy, that there's not any expectations, and so it's kind of a clean slate to think about um, the urbanity of that um, city um, as we move forward. Um, Katerina Rudy Ray talks about Toledo, goes through the kind of um, the glass industries that were very prevalent in Toledo, um, and, and looking at sort of downtown reclamation projects. Um, uh, Richard Summer, dean at uh, UT, um, uh, talks about Toronto, which, you know, is, um, talks about, you know, Toronto is the coolest city in North America at the moment. It's on every, it's in Vanity Fair, it's in Vogue, it's the top of this list, that list, the other list, um, and talks about also that within the context of the amalgamation um, that Toronto uh, went through over the last 10 or 15 years, um, and how the kind of larger I mean, you can see the kind of population spike um, as a result of that amalgamation, um, you know, the kind of political, social, cultural implications of that as the, the greater Toronto area moves forward in the future. Oops. Uh, Julia Zerniak talks about the Syracuse Connective Corridor, which was a two-mile urban design project that she completed with James Corner that linked um, the university, which was really the only kind of economic engine in Syracuse, to the downtown area as a kind of regeneration project. And then um, the last one profiled here is the Montreal entry that looks at uh, water infrastructure, predominantly the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Lachine Canal, am I pronouncing that correctly? Um, which closed in the early 1970s um, and trying to understand the redevelopment of that area um, but the scale of the canal and the St. Lawrence Seaway are massive within this area, so the kind of scale of intervention is much, much different than perhaps some of the other cities. Um, and then the last category, real quickly, is that we end with um, another P category, plans, um, which is a list or a kind of index of 117 urban plans for the region since the year 2000. They're index. Oops, sorry, hit the wrong button. Um, you can see that they're indexed here. So no surprise that most of these projects are like uh, close to the big cities. Um, they're organized via lake, um, and they're all sort of more or less bird's eye views, black and white. So you really you know, it's that the purpose of the index was not to study any one urban project, you know, on its own, 
but that just through an array of 117 of them, you get a grasp um, for how kind of real estate in the region is being redeveloped. Some of these are not good. I mean, we call them the good, I call them the good, the bad, and the ugly. We didn't kind of cast any value judgments. Um, some are designy, uh, some are not. Um, but what's interesting is, you know, the kind of, yes, the, 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 um, there's a lot of them in the big cities, but also in, you know, Thunder Bay or Duluth, all these kind of maybe cities that one would think are, are peripheral, on, on, which are not in terms of other economies, but are flipping their kind of um, waterfront real estate, thinking about the future economy of their city. So that was kind of really revealing, I think. So that's just some of them here. Um, and are we ending our, Danny, is this your cue? Oh yeah. Okay, so, um, so my role is twofold today. Um, I'm gonna basically throw a couple of um, kind of conclusions, preliminary conclusions of what we think is relevant about this uh, kind of book project. More than anything as a way to, to enter in the, in the discussion with our um, panelists today that I'll, I'll introduce in, in a second. So the kind of uh, preliminary conclusions, and I, I say preliminary because in a way we don't know the, what's going to be the kind of like reach of the book. We hope that it's, it's going to be important and it will have an important contribution, but it's, it's yet to be seen. So the, the first one uh, is this idea of um, the kind of the creation of this kind of network of expertise. Uh, in the words of uh, Keller Eastening in the, in the foreword, the idea of the network of thinkers and practitioners that somehow are putting together a body of knowledge on this particular uh, region. Um, obviously combining from a range of, of disciplines, although primarily um, kind of anchor around design. We have obviously architects, landscape architects, um, historians, um, you know, basically trying to give from different angles their, uh, their thoughts on, on, on the region. And, and you know, in relation with, with these ideas, also we feel that this kind of network of thinkers and, and practitioners are in a way kind of um, creating a, a, a kind of like tool and, and a kind of like instrument that could potentially be a good resource for, uh, for future uh, uh, intellectual development, but also kind of more practical development on, on, on things on the region. The second um, idea is um, uh, the kind of the role of the architect or the designers as a kind of like atlas maker, that in this book we kind of envision, uh, you know, Technically, we are the kind of the editors of this book, um, but we thought we have played a kind of like hybrid role between being authors and being kind of editors. Uh, we were playing with this idea of the kind of the composer and, and the kind of director of orchestra because there are so many voices, so many mediums, so many pieces of content that needed to be kind of like a, like put together into this kind of broader um, uh, whole. So, although the book in a way is a kind of like collection of mini books, as, as Claire was saying, with all these kind of different sections. We truly believe that by the adjacencies they are creating, the kind of narrative order they are, um, uh, they are kind of like depicted, they are creating a kind of broader a kind of whole, not just simply a kind of mere collection of, 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 of individual um, items. And, and probably a kind of like beautiful way to, to test that um, is, is just if, you know, if just by reading, uh, you know, the entries on this kind of index that, by the way, um, uh, Lane uh, helped us put together, he was a minute ago here, um, you know, if one reads just the entries on, on the letter A, uh, you know, we have from uh, actor network theory um, to, you know, Arup, a consultancy of engineering, AECOM, a major, like, uh, you know, design corporation, we have, uh, you know, uh, environmental historians doing like, uh, you know, beautiful contributions. Sorry, I, I mean, it's, it's hard to read from here, but basically, if I'm not mistaken, the late Great Lakes, which is a wonderful environmental history of the region done 30 years uh, ago. Um, to even like, you know, policy making like the auto pact or, you know, particular industrial um, uh, processes in the region or even very specific like, you know, infrastructures such as the Ambassador Bridge or, or particular locations. So we feel that if you were to read an index of an atlas, probably you will find mostly locations 
we feel that this is a very good representation of what we are aiming to do, that at the, at the end of the day you have like from, you know, theoretical concepts coming from social theory all the way to, you know, institutions, to policies, to locations, and that's pretty much what we uh, hope is at the very core of the, um, of the kind of like the spirit of the book. And then the last uh, idea, um, and again, as a way to trigger into the discussion, is, is, uh, is the kind of the role that the Atlas play within, obviously, design disciplines, but also other disciplines. Now, we, we seen that almost the, quote unquote, the death of the Atlas, uh, you know, I don't know how hard it's, is, is today to kind of like find atlas that has been recently developed, probably as uh, Charles was introducing today, um, is, is maybe obsolete in the way that is, you know, something that is kind of physical, it's not kind of digital as, as everything today. So in a way we are trying to kind of recuperate that spirit, but also with a more important statement that we feel that, again, going back to, to Keller Easterlin, um, uh, forward, the idea of like starting to specialize, to kind of ground, to make a, you know physically, hydrologically, ecologically specific all these processes that otherwise tend to be just um, happening in, in a kind of like more quantitative, abstract, bureaucratic uh, kind of policy layer. So we feel that in a way maybe this is kind of like uh, jumping on the kind of urban geographer's uh, kind of like um, uh, sphere, but we also feel that it's an important um, kind of statement to put together and I think we designers in general are kind of uh, very well equipped to start doing that that kind of more physical and more grounded um, um, uh, type of, of work. So, you know, one nice anecdote about, about that is that, you know, the, the way your atlas typically are organized is typically with a temporal narrative or a scalar narrative. In a way, as you have seen from many of the sections that were presented by, by Mason and Claire, our book is always organized hydrologically, the way the water is flowing, and we thought this is a kind of like nice, nice example about this idea of making the processes a little bit more, um, you know, specially um, grounded. So, um, so after those three thoughts, um, I would like to introduce the three uh, contributors of the book and also uh, panelists today. So starting on, on my far left, uh, Rana Ghosh, which is a assistant professor of uh, architecture and urbanism at the uh, MIT in the Department of uh, in the School of Architecture and, and Planner and designer with um, uh, El Hadi um, of uh, Design Earth, both of them contributing here. Rosetta Elkin, uh, assistant professor uh, here at the School of uh, Design uh, in the Landscape Architecture Department and director of the uh, MDES uh, Risk and Resilience uh, Concentration. And lastly, uh, Pierre Velangier, uh, associate professor the same in, in the same department in the Landscape Architecture Department and director of OPSIS, um, contributing the three of them. So. Um, Hopefully we are going to be making this very um, open and flexible, but I'm going to throw a few questions. Don't worry, I'm not going to examine you on your papers. I think <laughs> they are there. People can, can access them. So, I mean, the plan is to have a conversation hopefully around the, you know, the book and the kind of like um, these ideas that uh, we were discussing around it. So, um, so the first question would be, for all of you, and please feel free to, to jump. Um, the idea of, if you think like this book, uh, or even more precisely the subtitle of this book, the idea of Prelude as a Plan, if you guys feel that the, this kind of volume, I know you have not read in depth the book yet, but just maybe with this kind of a exhaustive presentation, if you guys think this is a good tool, a good like kind of instrument to start um, and being mobilized toward this idea of like uh, you know preluding plans, preluding things that are gonna be basically happening in the in the region, we feel in a way that is a good cognitive device that is putting all these different scales of these different processes into a kind of you know physical form that people could get to know. But I throw the question to you: Do you guys think this could potentially be a good like um, uh, prelude to a plan? We're, we're hoping we can deflect to the designer Sienna scarf. <laughs> Is this suggestive? No, not at all. Uh, well, um, well, thanks very much. Uh, first of all, um, Claire, Mason, uh, Danny, Charles for um, having us here, and also to be able to see to see the project come to fruition over, uh, over the course of you know a, 
a number of years, which is particularly important just in terms of the digestion of the project and also an understanding how, how one confronts necessarily. Ten, is it 10 years? A couple, couple Di years. We, we were enjoying yeah. the digestion, I think, is exactly digestion. the right Incubation. In digestion. And, and incubation <laughs> may, be, may be emergence. Um, um, and we're looking forward to the second one, obviously, Atlas Volume 2. Um, what I think is particularly interesting, maybe to the, to the question of the relevance of the Atlas as a medium um, of design, but also as a medium of communication within um, a multiple number of discourses in urbanism, I would just um, mention what I think is particularly interesting as part, of, as part of the project, and one could argue the reclamation of this um, uh, genre format precedent of of, of, urban, of presenting urban information, territorial information, is that not only does it essentially recuperate, let's say, the a discourse on the region itself from, let's say, regionalism or the megastructure from the 60s with McHarg to 70s and 80s megastructure movement um, in architecture. And, and one could argue it's also a, a contest and a challenge to you know, Richard Florida's notion of creative cities and cities as their own kind of incubation hubs. Um, I particularly appreciate that challenge to Floridian thinking because actually very few other urbanists are coming out with any legitimate form of urban discourses that are actually challenging conventions um, that are really centering on uh, the idea of the city and proposing the territory through the region, uh, in this case through, through the Atlas, um, as a legitimate but also projective alternative. Um, and I think that's particularly important. Um, and I was struck by, I'll just, maybe one anecdote. I was, I was struck by, um, you know, the presentation that, um, that Charles and Mason had given a f a maybe, maybe even a decade ago um, in Toronto to a number of urbanists and architects and presenting the region itself as potentially like an unfinished region amidst a number of people that were sort of frightened by the suburbanization and the decentralization of cities, and just wondering that essentially that's the, the you know suburbanization and decentralization as like the environmental apocalypse. And all of a sudden, I could see everyone in the room when they presented this idea of the region as sort of like, well, it's just an unfinished region of about like 23 million people. I mean, what, what's what's to worry about really when you see it from another scale, another perspective, and a whole different resolution. Um, categorically, I think every architect in the room was absolutely frightened. Um, and I think that's probably the same response that you're going to get in a number of different cities in which, um, you know, people have essentially been working at a kind of like a city, so-called urban municipal scale. And that's the challenge of the Atlas as a kind of like legitimate uh, vehicle. And one could argue that this is, it doesn't necessarily make a claim to the region as opposed to potentially like a preliminary introduction to the subject itself or even a recu recuperation of the subject, which I think is particularly important. I'll just say one last thing in, in closing is, you know, to, to the point that if the map precedes the territory and one could argue over the past 200, 300 years that the map itself has been an instrument of projection of power and one, you know, we have to admit that it is a projection of colonial power. Um, that if we admit that we're in a kind of colonial present, what's particularly interesting about the Atlas is that, and the process of decentralization or potentially even disurbanization in terms of the horizontal spread, that it also opens up the territory and provides a vehicle for, um, for the decolonization of the region, which I don't think is accidental that we're beginning to see a number of territorial claims that are actually being, um, uh, uh, that are placed by First Nations um, and indigenous peoples on both sides uh, of, uh, of the Great Lakes region and on both sides of the border that are interrelated. So I find that particularly exciting as potentially part of a decolonial project on the horizon. Well, I don't want to, I know you have other questions and we also want to open it up, but I will, I will try to answer to your prelude to a plan um, inquiry. Um, but somewhat obliquely, I suppose, because I'm, I'm, I'm struck by Keller's words that you paraphrased uh, earlier, Charles, of coming up with our own terms. I would see this atlas as really a design atlas. It's specifically 
kind of pilfering from a series of other um, agendas, other disciplines, to sort of amalgamate something that is more digestible to those of us that may want to address scales in the region that are otherwise you know, difficult to manage, difficult to um, uh, imagine. Isn't it 53 million in the, in the mega region? I don't know where, I, I think it's 53 million, but it's somewhere which is, uh, whether it's 23 million or 53 million or somewhere in between right now, it is, it is kind of this, this concealed uh, population that sits in this, in this bowl. Um, um, which, so, so what's interesting to me about the term atlas, especially via a design discipline uh, framework, is that it de-stresses the urban by um, expressing all the material agents and procedures that collectively amalgamate to create the urban. So as opposed to looking at Chicago or as opposed to, you know, uh, bearing down on Detroit again, if I may, um, we're, the, the locks and the ex situ environments and the, the tiniest molecules all the way to the climatic and atmospheric pressures um, over time, the snow lake effect. I mean, all these images that we were seeing, I'm sorry, I haven't sat with the book either, but certainly, um, it's the processes that create that urbanization. So in a way, by deleting the urban in order to get closer to it, it's, I think it's a very interesting uh, design atlas uh, uh, work to also paraphrase Keller, a kind of subtractive urbanism, whereby by taking out that which you're looking at, in particular, to also to extend her thoughts, um, you know, you start to get at the actual meat of the issue, if you will, and that is how um, how regional and expansive the urban extends to. There is no, of course, rural or, or urban. We know that, we've gotten over that. But when you start to look at the, the DEM and you start to think of, of, of the thousands of locks and the you know, incredible size of the mines, um, the number of ports and you know, everything that creates um, the economy and mobility, um, of these 52 million in, in the, some of the heaviest winters and through some extreme droughts. It's rather, um, uh, it's, it's rather, I suppose, it's, it's interesting to me how it refuses boundaries, even the boundary of something like um, a third coast. So I will pass it on to also open up uh, other conversations. Um, so, I mean, for me, there's a distinct, almost autobiographic relationship to this book, which is kind of uh, serendipitously manifesting today, because some of the interests behind geographies of trash were departed actually in a conversation with uh, Pierre here a few years back now, as I was packing to head to University of Michigan. And he said two things. One, uh, beware for your winter tires and the salt there. So it's here. And then while you're there, make sure to look at the many landfills that will be around the region. And I think when you first land in a new setup and you're kind of looking into where to start a new research project, I think the, the landfill was a, was a great first uh, destination. So thank you, Pierre, uh, for that invitation. Um, and I think in that invitation, there was a call to look for a research project. And this is where this one in particular started on an urban matter beyond the scale of the city. So the, the umbrella actually was, a, was, was the generous hosting of the former Dean Monica Ponce de Leon of a research on the city initiative at the University of Michigan, uh, which was, a, I think, a kind of a complementary relationship to a, a research through making that the school had a long tradition in, which emphasized materiality, uh, the scale of the installation, to open it up to larger scale. And there was some kind of a tongue-in-cheek provocation in our kind of pitch for that, uh, for that grant and saying, well, if you put all the areas of landfills in the state of Michigan, they'll kind of make an, an Ann Arbor-sized township, which was um, kind of granted smaller than we had expected, but a good way to kind of give a sense of an analogy of the spaces that are not often represented um, in relationship to the, to the claims of the project. Um, so that's kind of a, a small entryway, but I think for me the, there's, a, there's a, a long genealogy and a rich history in what the Atlas draws on, uh, whether in terms of the, the kind of regional inquiry that um, Brodel's Mediterranean would bring about also around the body of water and also kind of a, a, a sectional dip into anywhere from mythology, the kind of the, the, the um, uh, 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 
earlier myths and histories of the region up to kind of contemporary trade routes and what that imply. So there's a, there's a sense of a, of a unity. And the Mediterranean was called upon at different moments for its a different quest, which might be different than the nation state or different configurations of power. And I almost read that desire in the Third Coast Atlas, maybe at this particular moment in time, an invitation to look north <coughs> as the kind of the P of potentialities or a kind of a recentering of a, of a region that, you know, has been kind of the flyover region, as many had told me then, that there's, yes, the East Coast and the West Coast and the thing in between. And I think the Third Coast, in, a, in a, almost in a situationist uh, approach, <laughs> borrows the term of the coast to say, well, you're forgetting about the Third Coast in here. So the title for me carries a kind of a wink-wink setup, which is very inviting. Um, so the, the, the way that I'd love to see it move forward is also kind of a definitely in the domain almost of a, of a second edition and maybe in, around the same efforts that might start with, you know, more teaching, I guess, more people who are thinking kind of a, about this region so that the Atlas has its operative value as a, as a reference work that it launches a new project. And maybe for, for the editors at one day, kind of what Humboldt's Cosmos was, for, for him, uh, what, what the Americas were for, for Humboldt, which is your extensive travels and lives in this region, that uh, there's, a, there's a formulation of an approach to geography travel, but maybe possibly a broader scientific, uh, geographic uh, uh, design approach to people beyond the design field. So I'd love to see this book travel definitely within the hands of students, but also to make it to a broader public. And mm -hmm. for that to start to give us an understanding of what it is to look at a region. Um, uh, so best of luck on that. Thank you so much. We are, I can tell you, our friends at Akhtar are working on a handle system <laughs> that will allow this to be more portable than it might. Wheels. Um, <laughs> So maybe one one more question, and we we can open it up to the to the audience, which is is great to see so many people here. Um, and actually, I think it relates uh, in a way three of the comments that has been um, made. That you know, we we wonder if you know Rosetta, you were mentioning that this is so much a product for designers as well to try to really help us envision how the region operates and how to start visualizing and how to move beyond this kind of urban centric uh, historical grounding on the on the discipline um, but but in a way we don't know i mean we we, we kind of try we're trying to guess what's going to be the result and we I mean, we were trying to think in a way if, as, as Rania was just mentioning, I mean, could this have the potential eventually to start reaching other disciplines to be a vehicle that just by the, by the you know, it, its capacity or its, I would say it's a kind of visuality that is, 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 is being able to kind of put together all these different variables, but in a kind of a, like very visual medium, start helping, you know, other uh, disciplines to maybe engage with the, with the question from, uh, from our kind of, um, particular angle. I mean, and, and kind of another anecdote from probably all the things I've been doing in my seven years here at the at the GSD and counting. Um, <laughs> probably this is the project that I have not been able to, I mean, it was not necessarily a kind of explanation of what I'm doing. While new geography is, is great, but it's so obscure in many ways, everybody understood from, from the very beginning the kind of like the scope. And it's true, there are many hidden layers that people will need to go through the entire volume to really grasp. But at a kind of like more mainstream level, it, everybody is starting to understand what, what's about. So I'm very curious to know your thoughts about this. I mean, is, is this just a product for us and, and our it, it scope should finish there? Or really could it start engaging from I don't know, like, uh, you know, governmental bodies to other crazy disciplines that maybe they start, you know, using it as a, as a probe. I, I feel like you're looking at me, so it, it sort of puts me on the, on the spot to answer. Um, first of all, I mean, I think everyone in the room is very sympathetic to the fact that uh, designers have a way of readdressing, re 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 repackaging, revisualizing, kind of retooling with uh, otherwise quite common uh, data, denominators, and um, 
in, in so doing, we open um, eyes to what may seem very common and mundane uh, in, a, in a very spectacular way. We kind of are able to push very, very simple things into abstraction and thereby open up a completely different dialogue. Um, even if I look at, at, the, at the cover, I think for most people, outside of design disciplines, this is already a peek into a universe that they're not familiar with. Um, and, and I think, I know myself personally, I'm very interested in conce the, 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 the aspects of what we do that are extremely concealed from human view. So if you can't photograph it, if you can't put it under a microscope, if you can't just fly above it and find it and, and therefore redraw it, but rather we use that abstraction to push uh, on things that are, are less visible. So I, I concentrated on the salt formation because nobody has any idea of the extents. Nobody can really, it's called endless. Um, the Canadian government claims that it's a thousand, it's a, a, a sorry, it's a thousand trillion tons of salt just on the Canadian side. You know, I mean, how did they get that number? Um, it it uh, it's 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 so ephemeral in a way, and yet it's so solid. It is it is absolutely what underpins mobility in the entire region because you have the worst snowstorms and what they call whiteouts, and we've all had whiteouts um, because of the lake uh, snow effect. So, so you've got this, this incredible resource and everybody talks about the freshwater resource and there it is lying on the surface, but the only thing that can create such a mega region in that climate is this salt um, that, we, that we blast out from, from miles below the lakes and spread on our roads as humans. So nobody can, nobody's allowed down there. They build the trucks down there, it goes down there in pieces. You know, there is an entire universe in these salt domes under, underground, uh, their own roads, if you will. Um, and how, how can we start to not only reveal that, but then make that connection with the surface as designers? So, you know, someone at SIFTO will know about that salt and someone w in Chicago will, will know about the effects of, let's say, salt on their tires and, and, their, and their roads, but they may not make the connection to the larger region and how it actually starts to, you know, create or, or, or deform um, the surface. Mm -hmm. so, so I suppose that's a, a long-winded way of saying that we, that we can kind of peel back a lot of these and sort of delaminate a lot of layers that are taken for granted and put them out there. And by putting them out there so beautifully as you've done, and thank you, fantastic editors, for doing the work uh, to, to do justice to all the efforts inside. Um, to, you know, to put them out there for other people to make connections they would not normally have, have made. Do you want me to put it here? So we open it up? Yeah. Yeah, let's pass on mic. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, just to keep it brief, to what extent do you think these atlas could serve as a template for developing atlases for for other regions, to what extent is it a template or or not due to the particularities of this specific region? I mean, I think the, the first thing we tried to establish was that we are, you know, as always, working on the shoulders of others, right? So the on, on the one hand, there's this long delay, you know, the the, the, the problem of um, of map making and the cartographic anthology is a long problem. Um, at the same moment, we were also, you know, of course, like many of us in the room, many of us in the school, many of us in our fields, motivated by the, the liberation of getting past urban form, urban morphology, urban conglomeration to describe the forces and the flows, the biologies um, that underpin and enable urbanity. Um, but having benefited from that um, liberation in the last decade, um, we were also looking to try to situate and make more specific to a kind of grounded set of conditions. So for us, the question was in part, what can we say that's specific about this place benefiting from the liberation from needing to be Chicago or Toronto that would be specific and would resonate and be somehow authentic in a way, like real and, and, and genuine. And at the same moment, we were inspired by various projects that I think of as generally projects of autonomy through cartography. One of the projects that um, Danny was involved in a while ago was this project that became Hyper Catalunya as an example. So in that case, obviously, you have a very long-standing and still very uh, contemporaneous a political challenge around autonomy relative to the nation state. And 
we're not proposing a referendum for the Great Lakes, but it, the idea that somehow the, na the construction of you know, national state identity was inscribed in this place from very early on, from the very earliest cartographic conventions, as Pierre said, this was clearly both a colonial project but also a, a, a project of nation state construction and maintenance. And so I don't imagine we can get past that very easily, but certainly we do aspire to acknowledge the fact that regionalism itself is an intellectual problem. We can't simply uncritically simply uh, readopt, you know, the failures of the modern era. Having said that, there are certain things that are territorial which are not planetary. And having said that, I would think for me the most durable aspect of this might simply be uh, the methodology of thick description, the Clifford Geertzian sense of let's describe through multiple layers of kind of redundant uh, representational strategy, uh, a kind of thickened condition, and then a plurality of voices. If, if four dozen people that have worked and lived in this region collectively conspire to something, that might be more durable than if any one of us um, came up with it. Maybe just to build a little bit on Charles's comment is that I think also the, um, the, 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 I guess, integration of content, both cartographic conventional content or an attempt at some form of conventional familiar content, as well as maybe more um, minor anecdotal components. I think certainly stories of waste, stories of salt, stories of uh, industry, stories of border crossings um, uh, were, were a way to kind of combine um, you know, distanced um, observations from maybe grounded observations, and and the um, the kind of minor minor landscapes that the smaller scale afforded, and recognizing that they they are contributing to that larger kind of vernacular. If if the third coast has a vernacular, it would be found in in, in between these two conditions rather than only in uh, looking from above. So in a way, as a kind of compartmentalized critique of the atlas as a format, it, that it's always. Uh, in some ways, overlooking that um, kind of grounded content. Um, so, er, so earlier, um, I'm looking at the book. There's a lot of cases being made of looking at the land and um, how that starts industry, mobility, settlement, and also then power structures within the region. And in your introduction, Charles, you had mentioned the, uh, the term geological determinism, and I sort of want to know your definition of it and how this collection of essays and um, uh, maps uh, sub either support that or disprove that. I, um, I mean, I'll, I'll invite my, my colleagues and, and um, co-editors to characterize their own feelings on this, but for me, you know, personally, um, I think we, we, we operate in fields, many of us, that have an intellectual history, right? And these histories are consequential to the opportunities for thought today. And among other things, we, you know, planning, gen broadly speaking, in the Anglo tradition, certainly in landscape and landscape and ecological planning broadly, has tended to um, build upon a kind of lamentation. There's a long intellectual tradition in which we tend to lament the fact that we do not organize ourselves politically and economically along geologic lines. Um, I put it in those terms simply because I want to problematize and thicken the problem. And I don't think there's anything in the atlas that um, lets us off the hook for that. But I guess for me, the editorial frame would be rather than presuming there was something, some emancipatory potential as if we could get either past geology or that we, could sh we should lament the fact that we're not organized politically around it, would be to just thicken and study the challenges that it produces. So r rather than a project of state, you know, autonomous formation, we're not proposing that the watershed or the geologic formation should become a new political in instrument. There's a reason why we haven't organized ourselves that way. We do think the fact that we have this body of water and a geological history that straddles both national and provincial boundaries has characterized our life and our experience here. And so for me, it's maybe a, that kind of Geertzian thick account it's interesting here. And simply to become aware of the extent to which we work in disciplines, especially in landscape architecture, especially in planning, where we tend to lament the lack of order in our political alignments vis-a-vis -vis geological alignments. Um, first of all, congratulations. I don't think anybody 
working in this territory can avoid your book. So I don't think there's worries about selling it. <laughs> and it's opened up and just sitting here. I've learned all sorts of things I never knew before. Yeah. I'm, I'm really curious about this phenomenon of region. Um, on the one hand, we're dealing with, if the numbers are right, the population of Tokyo distributed around the Great Lakes. And so I'm happy to think of Great Lake City. On the other hand, I'm thinking of Cronin's effort to link Chicago to Texas or to West Virginia, Philadelphia, and New York. And I'm thinking, what are the horizons where this region leaves off? Or is there one horizon? Does it really depend on what you're doing? So for example, if you're into high-speed data between the Commodities Exchange and Wall Street, Chicago is closer to New York than it is to Milwaukee. And you know, if you're a bird migrating, there's a different kind of proximity or connectivity, and that you're really dealing with layers of connectivity. And it's not simply the watershed. It's not simply the transport networks. Why does Chicago end up being the gateway to the West rather than any one of the other? Blah. But that there's a way of thinking that <clears throat> outer horizon of the region as the, um, according to what people, things, rivers, animals are doing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Cl clearly, we have to you know, have a conversation about um, you know, the second edition, because there's obviously a lot to be discussed. I mean, again, I'll, I'll invite my colleagues to, to, to respond. I mean, for me, um, as I've said, I mean, for, for the better part of my career, you know, we've, we've been enabled, we've been buoyed along by the liberating effects of being able to get past urban form, urban agglomeration, to understand the forces and the flows. And that's been both liberating, but it also has produced at certain moments, a, it can produce a kind of alienation in a way, you know, and, and as, you know, kind of, especially as design disciplines, there's something about the relationship. And I think if I look at maybe um, the project that Jill DeSimone and I did a couple of years ago, Cartographic Grounds, there's a similar question there for me, which is, what kind of relationship to ground can we claim today? <laughs> you know, if, if place is no longer av av available to us intellectually, if region is itself, a pro you know, what can we say about a place that's not at, at you know at, at a planetary scale? And I, I appreciate very much the the way in which you describe that the, the intersubjectivity of horizon. That region is so fraught and so complicated that for every subject, human and non-human, they would encounter a completely and utterly different boundary. I think is exactly right, and I'm I'm stimulated by thinking about, well, what would that topo look like, right? What was that topo, uh, how, how, how would that gather the world? Um, and at the same time, you know, in, in my experience of living and working in the region for 20 years, there is something, it's not quite, there's something that's specific. And a part of what I think we've been trying to get at is what can we, you know, what can we gather together that people working and living in the region would would have an intuition about and would see themselves reflected in, but for whom they have been working in a very specific context, which is Toronto, or a very specific context, which is Milwaukee. And is there something that we could do that could gather knowledge and a network of actors that might be shareable? But I utterly agree. I'm completely convinced by your formulation of the idea of the, the multiple horizons around which we could describe this region as implicated, implicated in really a, a planetary set of forces and flows. I mean, maybe uh, to uh, to share a kind of an example of of work that uh, that students have engaged in in a thesis unit uh, I've led for two years on it was called the Atlas of the Corn Belt and it was precisely a response to your evocation of Cronin's Metropolis that looks at Chicago as the center of architecture and urban imaginary and seeks to displace that by looking at the extensive set of practices, uh, uh, scientific, technological, architectural, as well as a broader uh, geographic imaginary that looks at the region as a whole. So anything from the water towers <coughs> becoming the new fixation of industrial photography to uh, the uh, land grant institutions and the relationship of campuses to cities. And I think there's a there's the moment you start to maybe identify some of these um, resources, not only as flows, but actually fixations in space that requires their own uh, 
uh, farm extent, railroad transportation networks, storage areas, exchange markets in Chicago, and a broad imaginary that comes across those, not least the kind of the, the towers in the heart of the corn cobs of Chicago, you start to relate a broader regional sense that exceeds kind of a landscape understanding of the crop to start to evoke other also design practices from architecture to urbanism. And I think there is a kind of a rich domain of exploration in that as well. <laughs> One and then the other. Um, yeah, I, I just have a question um, whether or not there was any uh, maps or drawings done of underground aquifers. I know uh, Rosetta began to look at the subterranean, but I'm wondering if water was at all studied in the subterranean. Um, uh, why or why not? And I, I, as I'm thinking about it, I, I mean, the answer is sort of in your title. You were looking at coastlines, which I can see as being more tangible than the seemingly arbitrary lines that are designating regions and countries and states. But yet, there's still, it's, it's a line, it's a coastline, you know? So I'm, I'm kind of wondering if that was something that was considered, if you looked at yeah, underground water at all. Uh, sure, the short answer would be, yeah. I mean, in a 400-page book, there's going to be one of almost everything. So yes, would be the short answer. Um, it shows up in a couple of different places. Um, there is a. You know, there's a, a, vein, a vein, since we're a subterranean, there's a, there's a vein of kind of geologic, you know, kind of inquiry in the book in which the, the saline makes its presence, the aquifer makes its presence, and the deep geologic history is present as well. But I would say these are secondary themes, let's say. I mean, we were trying to focus very much, acknowledging that it, it's, it's fraught, right? The simple exercise of, you know, trying to draw a coastline is itself impossible. <laughs> Rosetta was reminding me earlier on at the University of Toronto, um, she was a part of a team that helped us to begin to just move, the simple act of moving from a GIS space into a, into a kind of CAD space is its own kind of geometric torture at a point in time. And so I think, I'll, again, I'll invite my colleagues to say more about that, but, but yes. Well, I, I would, and I, I might be putting words in the editor's mouth, uh, mouths, but it seems to me as a contributor that we were free to really look at the elements that really made up the region at any, you know, at any uh, elevation, if you will, uh, where by the book itself was offering this framework, it was a resist that we could work with. So if you didn't have that resist, just on a research methods level, if you didn't have the resist of how they were framing the watershed and how they were framing the, the coast itself, then you couldn't kind of slip and maneuver through those layers as an author. So it was, it was useful for, for the proposition and the framework to have the third coast so that we could blow it apart in a way. So I think, I mean, that may not be the case for every single uh, essay, but it seems to me from Claire's overview and also from the authors that I know who have contributed that that's, that's also the ambition is to sort of mess with that boundary and, and where you, you, you draw it in your own imagination or experience. I would say also just to quickly in terms of the structure of the book, it became interesting to inverse the, um, um, I guess the privilege of the atlas being at the heart of the book and instead actually making it more the intermission or the interludes between content. And so it's almost a sort of, you know, allowing the footnotes, the, the marginalia to suddenly expand and take up these kind of blue watery sections. If you look at the book in profile, they're, they're the pieces that really almost tell the story or try to tell the story, whether it's visible or less visible. And the atlas ends up in a kind of more minor role in an interesting way, more compact, more something that's maybe more readily available, maybe even something that might be disputable or colonial or change. I mean, all of the data is actually from 2015. <laughs> so um, as close as we could get to our print deadline. And so I think to, to allow some of that um, material and the voice of these contributors, the di diverse contributors, to really select content and select their material or their resource or their vantage point, whatever scale it might be, um, seemed a more advantageous way to encapsulate such a large uh, geographic area rather than to only let the drawings do the talking. So I think this kind of like shrinking and ex shrinking of the Atlas content and expanding of the, the narratives uh, and the stories behind the, the materials and flows that really drove its development um, was, was part of the agenda, I think, within the project. Um, 
it's, it's interesting. It's back to maybe Danny's first comment about architects making an atlas. I mean, you know, historically we're the generalists of, you know, the design disciplines. Um, and that, I suppose, is opportunistic and enables us to see across a, a large spectrum of information. It also can be a downfall. So, you know, if a hydrological engineer will read the book, he or she will pick out holes, you know. Um, if a geologist will read the book, he or she will pick out holes. If an economist reads the book, he or she will pick out holes. Um, and so, you know, at, at some point, um, there, are, there are lots of holes in the book. Um, and the question is, maybe it's not the specific information of each layer, but that at some point you have to read synthetically across many pieces of information at the risk of you know, missing something or be mischaracterizing something because we're not hydrological engineers or geologists or economists. So I think that's a really interesting question, maybe that goes beyond this document, but is maybe, you know, as designers or architects, landscape architects, when we start to think of very large scale things, um, you know, it's very hard to be, to cover everything or to cover the kind of first layer that's very important, or where you accept your own boundary as a, as a writer, editor, designer, as a disciplinarian. Um, so um, maybe there should be more information of aqu There's a diagram of aquifers in Texas, I can tell you, on like page 328. <laughs> but, um, that's, that's the risk one always um, runs into. Do you know what I mean? As as the architect generalist. Just briefly, yeah, no, I think that's. I just want to build on that because I think that's exactly right. Um, on the one hand, um, I think you know Danny mentioned it. the reason we include the the image from the you know one page of the of the index is to show how the four dozen contributors their work is imbricated in these in this network of knowledge. So there is a vast literature in very all these various cognate fields that this work is connected to, but. What we're doing as an atlas should not be mistaken as making an original contribution in those fields. That is, it's I think our role is what we found. I mean, one of the first diagrams we did at the University of Toronto years ago was simply to map the jurisdiction of all of the national, binational, multilateral, and private NGO organizations that speak for the lakes, and there are thousands of them, literally. And so the lakes are spoken for, and the literature in each of our cognate fields around the campus also is vast and available. So we don't in any way mean to speak for that. We try to connect you to it. Having said that, the spatial synthetic act is what we can bring to the table. And it's also the point that I wanted to make, just to build on that, is I think it's a role that we as architects have had historically, but is growing in terms of our sphere of influence as other disciplines around campus have adopted post-war, especially a mathematical uh, digital model. Many of them historically were disciplines around campus that used to draw. Like my working scheme is that almost every discipline at certain moments, you know, there was medical anatomy and engineers used to draw and there used to be geography here on campus. And over time, with the kind of professionalization of the sciences, 19th, 20th century, as other fields became much more mathematical, much more precise, they tended to atrophy in their capacity for representation. And here in the design school, like many other schools of our kind around the world, I think we've um, adopted after the fact those skill sets. So, you know, Hannah Arendt uses the term in migrated, culture that's in migrated. I think we've in migrated the cultural tradition of the atlas in a way because other disciplines have abandoned it, might be one way of describing it. Good. Let me just, I, I just want to go ahead, go, 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 go. I just want to underscore perhaps this, the observation that there's a kind of like resistance within the book. Um, to avoid um, a couple of things, which is the, the sort of very clear delineation of what a region is, which gives, to a certain extent, social scientists and applied scientists what they're looking for, which is a, a, a very clear kind of like bounded region, because that's what is evoked as part of the kind of uh, the, the, the very term region for a number of reasons. And to a certain extent, the avoidance of that, the resistance also as part of the project is, is, is particularly important. Because it also then starts to avoid what you could consider to be a number of different sort of platitudes within planning or social science-based uh, uh, and even applied science-based strategies, which are completely divorced 
from the kind of like complexity and also synthetic nature of looking at not, not just the ground in terms of land, but also it, it avoids platitudes while at the same time responding towards understanding ultimately how do we design not just with water, um, and one could look at potentially even uh, half century before the question asked by uh, Ian McCarg, the sort of preeminent region, regionalist, how do you design with nature? Now, the, one of the fundamental problems with, with people that have recycled those refrains is the fact that they haven't really looked at the kind of like methodologies and also the groundedness of essentially the process of research and the process of representation that led towards a kind of like an understanding of what the region could be. And so I, I think the fact that there, there's this resistance towards clearly delineating it and resistance towards defining, you could argue, at fundamentally what water is just in terms of, I mean, are the Great Lakes lakes? Well, they're not, right? It's, a, it's the world's largest estuary, right? I mean, that's why, <laughs> I mean, why else was there salmon um, spawning or going upstream literally this weekend. I mean, everybody was tweeting salmon going over locks. Or, or maybe I was the only one watching that. <laughs> um, but they're, they're, I mean, these, weekend, are, these, are, these are like phenomenal <laughs> images. These are phenomenal images just in terms of understanding. Salmon <laughs> um, In Toronto, salmon. everybody in Toronto was, was <laughs> tweeting this this fever, weekend. Salmon fever. But, but it's, it's phenomenal to, to understand this kind of interconnection. And so, you know, is it, is it watershed? Is it lake? Is it estuary? Is it coast? Is it littoral? Is it edge? Is it city? Why can it ultimately be all of those things simultaneously and then allow representation itself as a kind of like non-textual, graphic, spatial, grounded form of representation actually be the medium by not just to be able to communicate it, which I, which I think um, is a kind of like beautiful job on part of the editors and, 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 and Sienna's work. But what I find fascinating also is that it proposes like a way of working. And, and that's particularly important because, um, and it's particularly difficult for social scientists and applied scientists that are either looking for the economic unit, the bounded unit to study, or the social sciences that are looking to kind of like define it in platitudes of like place, which, which we're still dealing with right now. And to understand and, and that's important because, you know, it's social scientists that are writing policy documents, especially on, on my side of the border, on the northern side. You know, Canada just has too many social scientists that are kind of controlling policies that then led to plans. Uh, I'm Canadian. That's, so I can allow myself to say that. <laughs> but, but I think ultimately understanding so the, the atlas itself as a kind of like way of working um, and also ultimately designing different forms of water or waters themselves becomes particularly important. And there's a kind of like rebasing that it can be simultaneously a number of different things at the same time. Um, and that to be able to put representation at the center of that is particularly exciting and also I think extremely empowering. Cool. Maybe one last question or so we'll wrap it up. How much is the book? Yeah. <laughs> what are the actual dimensions of the book? <laughs> 33 million something. Yeah. <laughs> but it's available in the book. It is available, yes. Not here, but uh, via Amazon and major bookstores. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire, and thank you, Mason. Thank you, Rosetta, and thank you, Pierre.